Welcome, everyone. Are you ready? Welcome to this uh, program. My name is Helen larsson Posset, and I'm a curator for uh, the upcoming art exhibition, History Unfolds, here at the History Museum. Um, the, museum, the exhibition, History Unfolds, uh, will be opening in November. Uh, and this is an exhibition where we are inviting artists to create new works from our collections, but also working together with our researchers. The thematic for this exhibition is what is actually hidden, forgotten, or perhaps even hided in the museum structure. What have not been told before? This is the fourth time we are doing this program. Uh, last year we did this program, this program activity uh, for the upcoming exhibition. Uh, last year it was about uh, the Swedish colonial past. It was about queer uh, culture and museum. Uh, in March we did a program about the museum's role in the creation of the nation, Sweden. And uh, in next week, we will be in Norrköping, and then it will be about a brave museum. What is a brave museum, actually? Uh, and in May, we will talk about freedom of speech. So please come back. Uh, I can tell you to sign in for our Facebook. Uh, be friends with us in the Facebook page, and then you will get more information about the upcoming programs. We are doing this kind of perhaps special way of, of doing, uh, uh, talking about important issues, because we think this is a format that we like. We want to have uh, other persons, experts, artists, writers, debaters, ideas on what we are doing, or feeding into what we need in our work. Um, so we are actually uh, recording this and we will put it on the website and you can find all the other recorded uh, programs uh, from last year and, and on, uh, from uh, now on. I would like to present the group that will talk to us today and I would like to start with uh, Minna Hendriksson that have been traveling from Finland this morning. You are an artist that are working a lot with nationalism, actually, and you're dealing with it in a connection with social structure in society, but also looking at it in architecture, which I find very interesting. Kesar Mahmoud, uh, you are head of heritage, what's the English word for your your? I, th I think it's head of uh, cultural environment, the Department of Cultural Environment. The head of Department of Culture and Environment. That's not important. Uh, Swedish not National Heritage Board. That mm. is important. Definitely. Yeah. And you're also a writer uh, of a book that I have been reading, uh, The Hunt for Swedishness. I was translating it uh, too. Uh, and then we have Hans Ruin. Uh, you are a professor in philosophy at Södertörn. Sörgskola, and also one of our collab collaborating partners. Uh, you are uh, leading the interdisciplinary uh, research program, Time Memory Representation, uh, and we have had a lot of guests from that program here mm. in, uh, at the museum. And then we have Laven Mutadi. You are a writer, debater, uh, you're also film director, and the last film, uh, the film you did that was very, very successful was about Katarina Taikon, uh, that I'm sure most of us have been, have seen. Uh, before I give the word to Sanna, that actually will uh, be leading, the, leading us in this and will also tell us how we will act in this, this process, I would like to present my colleagues here at the museum because perhaps in the break afterwards we would like to have a glass of wine, uh, have something to eat in the bar uh, and talk with uh, us. Uh, and Cecilia, down there. We have Katarina, Fredrik, uh, Sophie, Inga, Penilla over there, our colleagues over there, let me see. Uh, we are having Pia, uh, a new friend of, of uh, at the museum. Uh, uh, 
uh, we have Petya somewhere. There we have Petya. We have Eva and Ville and Sanna. I hope I didn't forget anyone. We're a big crew here. So I hope you will enjoy. Okay. Uh, you are sitting in a circle. Actually, all of us are in a circle this evening. It's because of the form of this talk. Because the idea is that you are in a fishbowl, actually, <laughs> the four of you. And uh, the concept is that it should be a free talk for you. There's no person moderating it. Uh, and you will do it in, in your own, considering your own curiosities and interests. And uh, it's a closed talk for you, but it's possible for us, us listeners, to ask questions to you through one way. And that's from the small post-it notes that you have, some of you have, and the ones who haven't, you should share with them. <laughs> because when you feel like you have a question or a reflection or anything that you would like to add to the conversation, then you write it down. And I will collect them later on. So after about half an hour or something, when you feel that you have been coming up with some ideas and been talking for a while, then I will send in some questions for you from the listeners. And uh, the plan is that the talk will be approximately one hour. And um, I'm actually going to give the word to you, Kesar, to start. So, um, yeah, put on your microphones and... Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I really loved your presentation, both of yours. One thing that struck me was the image of uh, this uh, Viking Inga, the, the one we saw her last, was that, um, I mean, probably those who made this image uh, were doing it in, in a way to provoke the viewer. But I'm not sure that that image is actually uh, provoking someone, not at least in this audience today. And, and that's because what's these symbols that cultural heritage is, is, is a part of are constantly changing, uh, especially in these days. Uh, that that uh, image that was uh, being uh, used as something provoking, let's say five or ten years ago, isn't that anymore today in our time. And I, I thought, do you have any comment about, do you think that what's provoking us now is going to, I mean, what's going to provoke us in the coming five or ten years? Yeah, I think this is a very good question. I have no answers. Like, I really have this question, like, what is, uh, what is that would provoke us now? And. Uh, and somehow, like, uh, well, I come from Finland, and in that context, and maybe also here, quite a lot, uh, something that was uh, was somehow would have seemed as a very kind of uh, uh, racist way of talking, for example, uh, let's say 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, today does not, it's not that, because... Uh, uh, in Finland in 2011 happened this kind of uh, really this opening of uh, of radical right where which was uh, which got a lot of votes in the in the elections and uh, and kind of racism came out of the closet and ever since then the whole whole kind of political discussion discussion in the media has has moved to the right so so I don't know what is uh, um, what is provoking today and what is provoking in in five years from now? But but you are probably right that that image uh, which was uh, maybe provoking five years ago, it's not that anymore. But also I think about that image. It's uh, there is another kind of uh, element which is that uh, that. Uh, also, with this, like, let's imagine that this person in that image is a is a migrant, so ethnically non-Swedish person. So, so it is in a way also, I think, showing a place where, like, of kind of cultural assimilation, like, hey, like, you have to look like a Swede, you have to 
like these things, what we like, and you have to wear these uh, uh, yellow and blue things. What do you say? What what is provoking today? Well, that's a difficult question. I mean, um, uh, I come into this whole theme uh, through the research I've been doing on Katrina Taikon. So perhaps you all know about her. Uh, so she was a Swedish Roma civil rights activist and very famous author to the Katitsi books and uh, sort of uh, this figure in Swedish history that has been completely written out of um, our national self-image or the way that we have constructed <coughs> any kind of idea of, of Sweden. So this has been, of course, very, very interesting to dive into and to um, um, first of all, document, but then also um, problematize the uh, sort of erasure uh, of this person. Um, because in other countries, she would have uh, streets named after her, she would have plazas named after her, she would have um, departments at universities named after her, but in Sweden, she's sort of like Oh, wasn't it the person with the children's books? So this was tremendously provoking to me. And uh, now I've been traveling all of Sweden for almost four years, and I've been really from north to south. And one thing that I have found, um, well, something that has surprised me is that there has been a massive, massive interest to speak about this chapter in Swedish history and to speak specifically about her and the whole um, Roma history, the Roma presence in Sweden uh, through Katarina Taikon. And I mean, this surprised me in a positive way because maybe I was a little worried about unpleasant reactions, uh, sort of, uh, some kind of racist attitudes towards uh, this attempt from my side to, to give her the, the space that she uh, deserves in Swedish history. But I haven't met that. And that to me is interesting and I, uh, I have tried to analyze it. How come um, there is this massive um, interest, fascination, will to learn, will to discuss um, her legacy, her, uh, her politics. Uh, so I don't, I'm not sure I have the answer, but I see this definitely as something uh, positive, uh, uh, something that has to do with some kind of new opening to, um, to uh, this kind of this kind of opening to really nuance the notion of what is Sweden and what is our history and what 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 was it in the 20th century? Mm -hmm. well, I'm not the one leading this. No, no, but, uh, <laughs> I can if we, I, uh, if we don't have. Um, no, I was. Uh, Okay, I can pick up from there because um, maybe also direct the question back to you because I've been asking myself this question if, if uh, to, um, to what extent is what we sort of nominally call as a Swedishness or a Swedish mentality or a Swedish culture is it, uh, uh, is, it a, uh, is it a strong nationalism at heart and in that sense, uh, one that maybe has uh, a problem with, with uh, relating to its exterior, the other, or should we rather say that it is a uh, perhaps slightly more, uh, at least potentially welcoming form of nationalism? Um, and what you're saying is basically from your point of view, what you expected was uh, neglect, but there was a preparedness to receive this history and sort of re reintegrate it. Uh, because I was um, 
I was thinking about it also a little bit in terms of the Finnish example, because when we when we talk about uh, Swedish nationalism and the sort of the research on it and the kind of institutions that represent Sweden, uh, it's uh, uh, I think it's hard not to admit that if we if we compare to the other Nordic countries, uh, uh, all all these Nordic countries have their different ways of forming. Uh, something like a national sensibility, and it has to do with the events that uh, uh, came before the establishment of this national identity. And if we have Finland, for example, which is probably the, uh, I would say maybe Finland and, and Norway are the most sort of nationalistic countries in, in the, this space in terms of sort of standard uh, uh, criteria for this. And of course, they are the newest nations, so they have been they have established themselves fairly recently within the last uh, century, and uh, uh, and in the case of Finland, also fought violently, um, fought a war for this, uh, at least to sort of the ma maintenance of this independence, uh, and uh, I mean Norway potentially was at war also with Sweden but they avoided it. So there is something about this interplay. Uh, with Denmark, of course, more like Sweden, has a longer history of experiencing itself as nationalism. But what, what I, in my own recent attempt, uh, has tried to, uh, to think more specifically about, uh, I'm writing now a short piece about Arthur Hasselius. I don't even know if you know who he is. This is actually something for Helene. Where are you, Helene? Yeah. So, um, uh, so, and Atrocelius is uh, the person who, invented, who, who um, uh, created Nordiska Museet and Skansen. So he's a typical uh, and very, very interesting representative of this generation. This was in the 1870s that basically shaped the sense of, of, uh, of Swedishness and the nation. Uh, but what struck me so much when I read both about him and his own writings, that are, there are not very many, is that this sense of nationality that he expresses, and which is at the heart of his creation, the Nordiska Museet and Skansen, is not a uh, combative, combative nationalism. It's not connected to uh, a, um, li any kind of national liberation struggle. There's no threat at this point. Uh, but it's a very, uh, it's a, at the same time a nostalgic nationalism, and one which is profoundly animated by a sense of modernity as loss. Because what all these people see around them is that things are moving so quickly. Sweden is becoming industrialized, people are moving into the cities, the trains are going all over the place, the world is spinning. Sort of this Mar Marx idea that everything that uh, it's solid melts into ice. And this is really the experience of this generation. So we must preserve all these things, all these clothes, all these habits, all these old parties, all these songs. And he's collecting even this sort of folk poetry because it's disappearing. So what he builds is a museum, which is really a museum of an ongoing loss. And this seems to me an important aspect of, of, of sort of the Swedish national heritage culture. And, uh, and which, of course, create, it's a, it creates a different sentiment around nationalism as opposed to countries that have really had to fight a battle. I don't know what you think about this. I mean, you are partly representative of this administration. Of <laughs> I mean, I would say that Swedish nationalism is actually rather s strong and not, and not weak. And I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that Finland, for example, or Norway are more nationalistic uh, than Sweden. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think, uh, on the other hand, uh, in, in Norway or, or in Finland, as you were saying, they had to fight for their national identity. Mm -hmm. Where in Sweden, I mean, something that you don't... Uh, things that are just common, mm -hmm. you don't have to fight for them, mm -hmm. right? Because they are subtle. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's what makes the Swedish nationalism so strong, and because it's, it, th there's no one questioning it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's being questioned these last 20, 30 years due to globalization and migration. Mm. But in 100, 150 years, it was never an issue because it was so... Um, um, I mean, it, 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 it was common. It was mm. something that 
people just took for granted. Mm. I was wondering, love, you said that there were, uh, when you've been traveling from north to south, that there's an urge and interest in discussing Katrina Taikon. Is it, it, is it discussing her and her books and things as Roma cultural heritage, or is it as Swedish mm. cultural heritage? Or is it the both? Well, I think it's the both. Uh, and to me, what's so interesting is that most people showing up for these events are older. So they have this kind of living memory of the gypsies, the ones that came to your village or to your little town and they set up the tent. And so all of these myths that created this kind of like gypsy or the Roma uh, in, in sort of like the Swedish collective imaginative ideas. For these people, it's very, very real and it's very relevant. And they, they also know that they, they came with a lot of layers of, um, you know, the fear of what was going to happen if you got close to these people, or they were going to take your babies, they were going to do all kinds of things. So they want to address this. And I think it's, for, for many people, I think it's the first time that they get to really articulate some kind of, um, some kind of, before like immigration, some kind of uh, idea of the others within Sweden. Mm. And to me that's so interesting because I mean, I, 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 I call it like, oh, this was before, you know, before like, I don't know, before even um, the welfare state or at least in the, in the beginning of that. But then when you look at the 60s, it's all of these other values, all these other things are associated with the 60s. It's, it's really modernism, it's like progressiveness, it's um, equality. Sweden is like everything is moving fast and we're always like keep moving towards something better and better and better. So within this kind of um, success story of the 60s and of this like bright era, you have also these folkloristic myths that are so strong and so alive. And this, I thought, was so, so interesting, that how, how things develop on different layers in different pace and, you know, how, how these, like, come together. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit reminded, especially from what you said, Hans, also. Well, it's true that the, the Finnish nationalism or like the, the uh, yeah at least the national struggle was uh, uh, for a liberation but yeah but, but then it was uh, it was uh, it was a uh, bourgeois uh, liberation like the Finnish nation state was then a, a bourgeois nation state from its founding, uh, but, but uh, yeah, but it's like this good nationalism, bad nationalism. Um, also, I'm wondering about like, like, because uh, in my kind of ideas about nationalism, I'm, I'm often, uh, well, I, I, I refer to Etienne Balibar. I, I somehow, I like what he writes. And, uh, and but he has this idea that, <coughs> that uh, kind of there's a very, a short distance between uh, dying for one's father's land, for one's country, and killing for one's father's land. So, so mm. this is a, this is a very mm. um, small step, kind of from this good to the bad nationalism. And uh, yeah, and 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 then I'm came to my mind something that uh, I once heard from Tobias Hubinet. Um, Saying that uh, that uh, the kind of the pre-Second World War Nordicness was uh, was kind of 
as we know in, in Europe, uh, Nordicness was seen as the kind of the, the highest form of Aryanism, the, the highest race, um, the Nordic, Swedish and the Viking and, and so on. And, and, and then after the Second World War, it kind of flipped into this kind of uh, Nordic goodness. So, so, so that's, uh, the, um, that Nordic uh, countries are the world well doers and and the, and the kind of the most the, the exemplary uh, countries and and somehow like uh, still they are the world leaders they were mm. that before the second world war and they are that also after so do you think that's also this kind of this uh, that that there is so much understanding and also that there's so much criticality and and uh, kind of um, desire to 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 un, to look at history critically even that this is somehow part of this Sweden's self image of of goodness this uh, progressiveness and yeah i think the, i think the progressiveness is an important part but uh, and that's um, i would say it's it's a fairly new way of formulating the uh, the identity but it comes out of the late 19th century because, uh, I mean, going back to what I said earlier about Swedish nationalism, um, sort of in the, in the age of national romanticism, built in a certain sense of a sense of loss and, and, and sort of romantic nostalgia. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's a, uh, when, when sort of uh, Sweden uh, starts creating the represent, representation of itself as a nation during those years, it's of course in the aftermath of a kind of, of, of a shrinking of the nation, because the memory of the nation is still the, from, from the 17th century, when it was a, when it was a uh, leading uh, uh, power in Northern Europe. And this, this kind of echoes, I think, continue through the centuries. So you have to invent a new way of representing yourself. And I think progressiveness is one such very important point. And it comes out of this sort of late 19th century culture. So being the modern nation, and this becomes even more so with, with the social democrats, so the, and the whole, whole post-war atmosphere is animated by this. So, so isn't that also this, what, what you say about this, uh, I find very embarrassing way of sort of making yourself into a moral hero, which is we see a lot of today. We are sort of world champions in being sort of uh, good in different ways. I think that's... Uh, but but uh, but it's a, but it's a kind of reflex of this, not just being good, but being sort of the most progressive nations, the ones that are sort of furthest along a certain ladder of time, and this is part of defining yourself, not in terms of roots, because the roots are are lost somewhere in the back in in this old age of, of uh, the great empire. So you sort of transform yourself and you make your identity part of the movement of time forward. Wouldn't you? Mm. Mm. But I would say that that uh, struggle for root uh, isn't. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's not on the agenda, not because it's not important, mm. because it's not an issue. Mm. I think mm. that things that are an issue mm. are, are the ones that you are uh, defining and discussing and so yeah. on. But that doesn't mean that they are not seen as important. Mm. Right, but that's that they are not seen as something mm. problematic. No, I, th I think I think you're right about it. And you referred earlier to this distinction between weakness and strength, mm -hmm. and and um, I, 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 uh, if I understand you correctly, I think it's true. There, there is in that sense there is Sw Swedish nationalism is stronger in some sense than the nationalism of the younger nations, because it's uh, it's situated in a longer time frame, and I think one could possibly one can possibly interpret the way that. The historical museum here, as you referred to in your in your uh, uh, talk, as we walked through, that this is a progressive museum in a certain way. It is. I mean, the people who, who run this institution are very much very much animated by the idea that we are part of the constant renegotiation of of uh, how Sweden represents itself. It wants to be a progressive museum in that sense, and and uh, and this is of course not the sign of a weak nationalism because a weak or vulnerable nationalism will tend to uh, focus 
on its own ba basic symbols. So that's what you're saying also, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah, so the, a, a kind of strength is also displayed in this way. We are, we are generous, we can receive the other. We are prepared to renegotiate the way that we present ourselves. Would you agree? I mean, I think that's why it's difficult when you're a migrant, for example, mm. and coming to Sweden. It's, it's difficult to discuss questions of cultural heritage or national identities because the, the notion is that we in Sweden, we are not that nationalistic. Mm. We don't care about our cultural heritage. But mm. I think that's what they do. Mm. And, and things that you don't discuss or that you don't put on a display, I mean, it's, it's difficult to question them. Uh, but, mm. but when you come from outside, you feel that there are some bits and parts that are missing. There are some issues that we're not discussing. Mm. So I would say that it's much more difficult uh, to, to discuss national identity in Sweden rather than Norway. I mean, f Norway, for example, they had like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they have this debate about uh, Norwegian national... They have this uh, 17th May, as you know, mm. the National Day, and they had this uh, lady, she was... Uh, I think she or her parents migrated from Pakistan, right? So she had to uh, wear this Norwegian folk clothes and, 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 and have this flag and go in front. And they had a huge discussion there 10, 15 years ago. And I think that, that in Sweden we are having these sorts of discussions now. That, that's because our self-image is that uh, that's not something that we do. Uh, we are not that nationalistic. Mm -hmm. We have a question from the audience. Mm -hmm. I'll try to translate it. Uh, is it hard to talk about nationalism for a museum if uh, why is it so? And is it interesting? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, uh, I could just refer to what I mentioned up in the exhibition for, for those uh, who, who were not at um, uh, the tour that we did before this conversation, because I, 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 uh, I made the point of the fact that uh, when the museum in this uh, sort of the, the main exhibit on the second floor, where you move through the timeline. Most of you followed this tour, but those of you who did not. Uh, and uh, you move through the centuries of Swedish history, and once you come to the 19th century, there is a, uh, a sign that is supposedly presents nationalism. And nationalism is presented on a tiny little sign, and it says that during those years, people became sort of fascinated with flags and songs, and they started sort of representing themselves. But it's presented almost as if it was some little digression that took place during the 19th century, which we could sort of... So, as if, so what the museum basically says is that nationalism now belongs in a museum. Mm -hmm. It's there, in that corner. Mm -hmm. But of course, the entire institution would not be here if it was not for nationalism, mm -hmm. because this is a national institution, the, the, the purpose of which it is to tell the story of Sweden. And, and it's part of a very, very long legacy of such institutions that have been in, in, um, in constant uh, evolving for the last 150 years. So the whole museum... So it's a, it's a kind of trick in that way. And so the, maybe the, the, so the answer to the question would be, it is maybe a little bit difficult, because especially in these days, when we need to be, reflect very carefully about nationalism, and there are neo-nationalists of various sorts, the museum doesn't want to be nationalistic, but of course it is an institution which is part of nationalism, which is why it's interesting to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, one question that's like... <sighs> If you're dealing with stuff like this, it's like, okay, so what gets historialized? Mm -hmm. uh, what becomes a part of the stuff that we just know? We just know that Olaf Palme died. We just know that um, Sweden won this championship then and then. Uh, we, yeah, I mean, speaking from my own very uh, subjective position, I do think that we should know that Katarina Taikon was the one who made it possible for Roma to have the civil rights. So, uh, uh, I mean, this whole questions of what stories are um, 
part of this kind of like uh, unarticulated knowledge and what is not, I think is so central for, for how we perceive ourselves. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's the basis. And I just think of some stuff, I mean, the way that like knowledge comes to you, I, this happened to me just a few days ago. So I was reading this book and before I had read something else and I was, I was trying to do some research about like Jewish history in Sweden. And so you, you read about all these laws that was um, uh, especially for the Jewish community. You could live only there and there. You could uh, marry only other Jewish people and so on. And so, but there was never an, like an end to this, um, to the, this kind of information. And so my question was always like, okay, so, but what then happened? I mean, now uh, Jewish people doesn't have this kind of discriminative laws targeted against them. And so this knowledge just came into my little brain the other day, which is in 1870, the Jewish people in Sweden got their civil rights. Mm. So how can I not know this? I am 37 years old. I grew up in this country. This is my history. This is where I am shaped. This is the stuff that I'm supposed to know. It is nowhere if you don't have your special interest to go and look for this kind of stuff and to try and piece things together as like some kind of amateur historian. And uh, to me, I just find this almost shocking because it's so, it's so uh, sort of, uh, it's so matter of fact, it's so right there, it's so brutal. It's like cross over, put this away, hmm. move forward. So, uh, I mean, these are, I know these are like naive reflections, but I think that they tell us something. I mean, I think mm -hmm. your point, Kesa, is so great because national, nationalism in Sweden, it's like there, but it's not there. We, we are nationalist, but we just don't say it. We have this kind of self-image, we just don't put words to it. So all of these things, you have to, this kind of knowledge, you have to sort of conquer yourself almost because it is so marginalized it's actively re it's actively like written out of any kind of mainstream idea of sweden and i think this is i think this is super confusing but lauren don't you think that it's because we ethnicize I, i'm not sure if it's a word even but we have made we ethnicize cultural heritage. I mean, we say that this is Roma cultural heritage, not Swedish. This is Jewish cultural heritage, not Swedish. So therefore, I mean, historic museum or uh, history books, they don't have to tell these stories because they're not Swedish. And that was my question, that when you go out and talk about Katharina Taikon, I mean, do people see that as... This is part of Swedish history or Swedish legacy. Or is it still something that, oh, we are learning something about Roma culture? Because I think that's what's blocking them uh, to actually mainstream these sorts of uh, historical knowledge into history books and to, into these sorts of institutions. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think you're right. I think that's... Uh, <laughs> I think that's a big part of it, and uh, I mean, I do think it's a doubled thing because, on the one hand, we need to talk about specific specificities. Mm. We need, if the need is there, uh, which I do think absolutely it is, to say yes, I am Jewish, Swedish, and that means something. I'm okay, of course, I'm Swedish, but we also have this history, we also have this context, and this has shaped me as an individual. Yes, I am Roma, and I'm Swedish, and I need to, uh, I need to speak about this without, without it being something offensive to the nation or to Swedishness or whatever. So yes, I absolutely do believe that, 
a lot of people have this uh, this need to uh, to 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 be able to press that when whenever they need it. But I mean, this goes back to the whole idea of uh, what have we constructed as Sweden as Swedish. So you have this kind of like dominate dominate. Domina dominating narrative, and then you just like add a little pieces, and the, and the, of course the dominating narrative is also Sweden was a homogenous place mm -hmm. until the Greeks and the Yugoslavs and the Italians came in the 50s and 60s, and I think this is also some kind of, I mean of course a lot has happened in regards to migration in the last 50 years, but I think also this kind of very violent uh, sort of excluding way of looking at what has happened here in Sweden the last 500 years. It, yeah. it, it you know, it mm. just contributes to this whole mm. idea of... I, I want to say something to this because I, it's, it's very important uh, what you're saying in relation to uh, today many people in the <laughs> cultural heritage sector uh, all the way up to the um, uh, ministerial level are very much uh, preoccupied with the idea that we need to change uh, the representation of how the country is represented. Uh, we need to add to the image this or that other group or person because the dominant narrative is no longer representative. This uh, willingness to negotiate the representation is, in one perspective, in my view, a kind of sign of this sort of the, sort of the goodness of the Swedish mentality, the preparedness to negotiate itself. But on another level, it for, forgets or even um, pushes aside precisely uh, what you are saying, because what this narrative implies is that uh, the nation is one thing on one level, and uh, the missing piece can simply be put in there and then you have sort of the full mosaic again and it's full. Mm -hmm. But uh, a completely different way of writing a nation's history is to write that history in terms of the conflicts that generated this nation. And uh, the neglect of the conflicts uh, is something that also neglects the, um, the way that the present is always contested, which it is. So, so, um, and it's, uh, so you mentioned the Jews, but, but also the, the, the whole relation between the Swedish state church and the, um, uh, the popular churches, the free churches, is of course another side of this. A huge conflict, that sort of, it took a very long time, even, even it was even uh, much later that Sweden got the full religious freedom. And this full religious freedom was, of course, the result of a lot of people's struggles, mm. just as the working uh, movement was also a struggle. And this way of representing the nation creates, I think, a very different image. And it's something that you can also... Uh, it's, it's more difficult, it's more problematic, but it's something that I think also ulti ultimately it's much more useful for what you need today. Mm because the idea of adding a mosaic in the full picture completely neglects the fact that people are constantly struggling to achieve new goals. So, so mm. I perfectly agree with you. It's, um, there are very many narratives. I mean, certain narratives have become inscribed into sort of the, the general narrative, and I, I would say sort of the narrative of the working movement and the, and the, and the, uh, and the movement for, um, for popular vote. That is, of course, part of the story, but there are many other stories mm -hmm. that also makes problematic this idea of the, the, the homogenous nation. Here is a question from the mm. listeners, maybe connected to this. Mm. What do you think the treatment of the subject history is, uh, in Swedish schools has to do with nationalism? Mm. You could say something about Finland. Mm. <coughs> How is history taught in the Finnish in the schools? schools? It's a long time since I've been to the school. <laughs> <coughs> but, um, yeah, definitely it is not 
through the conflicts, but it is the kind of a one success story in a way. Mm. And uh, um, yeah. Um, yeah, and of course, like uh, uh, um, one needs to kind of all the time question this: How is the history written? And uh, and uh, and nationalism is not something that uh, that was at some point and is not in today. And uh, and uh, for example, I've been looking at how. Uh, nationalism connects with contemporary art and how also something like contemporary art which is so progressive and uh, novel thing um, how something like nationalism which is something seems kind of archaic Mm -hmm. uh, old thing how can these come together and uh, and they do they in fact do very much. So, so I'm sure that, um, yeah, in 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 our contemporary life, we 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 have to kind of recognize how nationalism is is reproduced all the time, as mm-hmm. as it is reproduced, and it's it's all the time changing its form. And it is nationalism is something very contemporary. It's not something. What what was the word that you were taught in school for the conflicts that erupted after 1918? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, in 1918, Finland got independence in 1917, so, and then there was the... What do you call it? There was uh, there was the civil war, civil war. and uh, yeah, yeah the, the, the war has many names. In yeah. in in Swedish, it would be the freedom war. Mm. So and and this also tells about one point of view, the point of view of the whites who who did uh, who saw it as an extension to the independence mm. struggle mm. because they were also making uh, the soldiers or yeah the, the people waging the war believe that they are in fact fighting against the Bolsheviks, against the mm. Russians, mm. which was not true. They were not Russians fighting. There were very few Russians. Um, uh, and for the red side, it was the, it was the class struggle. It was mm. the revolution also. It was the, uh, it was the rebellion. Mm. Yeah. But I guess uh, in Swedish, the, the name would still be the freedom war. Uh, most often, but that also depends. If you know something about it, then you're aware of this uh, this, uh, this distinction. And sometimes you would uh, be careful to name it, but but most commonly. But it's it's very uh, telling that the most decisive conflict in the history of the nation does not have a shared denomination, because just opening this box of what to call it opens the history of the nation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the the most neutral name that I've come across. It, there's probably I don't know 20 names at least for this war, but. The most neutral one is the events of 1918. (laughs) (laughs) You can even question whether it was a war. I mean, I was wondering, you said that nationalism is is something that's um, um, related to a certain era. Is it correct? Um, I mean, I was thinking, hasn't nationalism, in in one way or another, always been a part of... um, um, human history. I mean, uh, as soon as we come together and more than two persons, we create an identity of who we are. And whether that's on a tribal level or an ethnic level or a nation level. B- because I find it disturbing when we think, th- when we get an idea that we have evolved, we, we have become so modern that we are not nationalist anymore. Because, because I think that's a self lie. Mm. Because then we are stopping discussing uh, uh, the mechanism of how we exclude others. Because the thinking in this is us, the us group, and the other group, that seems to be something w- within our human nature. So my question is hasn't nationalism, in one way or another, always been yeah. part of. I don't know if it's always been. I don't know, kind of. Yeah, pre, let's say, 19th century, uh, if there was a, such a... Well, I guess it was not nationalism, but it was a cities, city citizenship or something. Like, uh, mm. people were not organized in, in nation-states. Uh, 
before the 19th century? No, I mean, it's, I mean there would be two answers to that, of course. I mean, on one level, anthropologically, people have always sh shaped communities in, in terms of different definitions. But, but uh, the specific uh, idea of being a nation has a history. I mean, you, you know this also. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's not, we, we don't find it before, the sort of the early 18th century. You would not define it in terms of nation. So, so uh, I, and I think that's important to think about because it's only with the, with the sort of uh, mo moving, moving into secularization and moving towards to the events of the late 18th century with, with the French Revolution, you have sort of the birth of the idea of being a nation and that the nation is a field from within which you can organize yourself and operate. Before that, it would be maybe a sense of community could be built on other kind of concepts, a sense of shared language or other things. But nation and the word, which of course comes from Nascor, so being, being born is basically sort of the etymology of this. So having come into being together, I would say, this, this sense as, as sort of being, be, sharing one's birth. Mm. Yeah. But I mean, do I agree with you that yeah. nation is, is a specific form of um, yes, society, yeah. right? Yeah. But, yeah, but you're saying, but that, of course, then it has yeah, because all I, the I roots. think often yeah. we talk in terms of yeah. uh, uh, being nationalist or being being having global identities, mm. like being everything at the same time. Mm. And and my, and the question, the point I want to make is that I think that uh, what what na nationalism is built around. Uh, a group uh, defining itself right, in a right, unique yeah. way, mm. using time mm. or history as in way of giving it, it authenticity. Yeah, and not only in order to secure itself here I mean, and now, but in order now, to, but to exactly. give itself a, tra a future, because yeah. it's, it's always has to do with the future. Exactly, and I mean, that's if what we, we, people we, have been doing. In yeah, the, we looked at the Sami exhibition. I mean, the, all this sort of national paraphernalia of the Sami that basically came into being in the 1980s with flags and national anthems and etc. Of course, this is related to a political struggle. This is the way it is to operate, a, a, and, and this is uh, this is how how uh, com sort of the the shaping, moving forward of communities somehow always Im impl imply a narrative where you you give yourself a history in order to act. And you motivate your action in terms of having a shared history. I think we see that everywhere. And it's not something you could take out of humanity. But it's, it's a kind of, of a, it's a framework and maybe also a, a passion that we need to, uh, to live with and, and reflect on. But we could not simply sort of take it, tear it out of ourselves. Or? No, I mean, no. it's like love or hate or mm. things like that. Mm. Basic human needs. Here comes a new question. Mm. Maybe a huge one, I don't know. Do we need a historical museum? Why or why not? Mm. <laughs> you laugh, but maybe... Mm. <laughs> but I think that it's very important to, to look at history, and, uh, but, but to look at history in relation to today and, and maybe in relation to future as well and, and, and to learn from the history and uh, um, yeah, reflect of what's happened to today and yeah, um, also like for example we should, we should all know uh, the history of uh, also of racism, let's say like uh, kind of race science in, in the Nordic countries and, uh, and uh, what happened in Europe during the Second World War and uh, and all these events, so that uh, we can recognize, uh, kind of, that these were not, yeah. Even I would say that uh, what happened in the Second World War, and like let's say Adolf Hitler was not something uh, that was not from this world, but he was, uh, he was a human being, and uh, and and somehow product of that society, and and you know where we are going now, like, it could be that there will be new Adolf Hitlers if we are not careful and, and somehow like, uh, and, and it was not that one person who did everything, but it was the, it was... Uh, but is it specifically the historical museum that will save us from fascism? 
yeah, I don't know if, if the museum is the place to learn, but mm. if not, what is then? No, because I mean, learning from history you can do uh, without museums. Because I think the question is, is interesting, it's necessary to, to ponder. Because the museum itself is a kind of, it's an historical event. And this specific institution is what? When was it founded? In the 1930s? Yeah, 30s. And of course it has a little bit longer history, sort of as an, as an offspring of the National Museum and the Royal Museums. But it's a fairly recent institution. And, uh, and there are no sort of historical museums representing nations that are all much, very much older, maybe 100 years old. So, so we, are, we are sitting within an in, in historical space itself. We don't know for how long it's going to continue. But on the other hand, it's very difficult to us, for us at this point to imagine something outside it. The only, the only thing we can note is that humanity has existed for 100,000 years without historical museums. And they have created cultures, and these cultures have disappeared. And they have made wars and loves, and they have created, written great literature without historical museums. Now we are situated in this space, and maybe it will continue for 100, 200 years. Or, or maybe this is the space that we will occupy for the rest of humanity. Who knows? But it's an historical space, right? I would say that these, uh, a museum or these sorts of spaces are uh, necessary in, in our times, mm. right? I mean, uh, I read somewhere that uh, people, when they turn to religion or into philosophy, they want to have the uh, answer of three questions. Where do I come from? Who am I now? And where am, am I going? And mm. I think that's what a museum is trying to yeah. give, mm. right? Mm. These yeah. answer mm. to these three questions. Mm. But not on a religious or in a mm. in a certain ethnic answer. So I think in our time where people are diversified and I think not that religious, they yeah. need a place where they can um, meditate or mm. find some sort of... Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, we should take this seriously, the fact that the museum grows out of secularization. And, and uh, where sort of the gradual decline of the, of the Christian temples uh, and, uh, and the visitors to the Christian temples are exactly simultaneous in time with the emergence of the museum as the space where society can reflect itself and where community life can take place. So um, uh, unless we are to move back to the churches, I, I agree. I think the historical, the museum, in the, the more general institution of the museum of which the historical museum is one space is the temple of secular life. And beyond that, we cannot see at this point. Maybe a later humanity will invent other such spaces, but for us, it is the museum. Yeah, but museums have also transformed very much into kind of places of entertainment. Yeah. They, are, they are not anymore what they were a while ago. They were mm. a place of learning. Mm. Now it's experience, entertainment, yeah. consummation. Well, you have many notes now. <laughs> so. <laughs> Guess what? Time is actually running up. But uh, I, since we have so many great questions here, I'm going to read them. Yes. And uh, you can bring them to the bar and talk to it, about it to all, <laughs> all of us. <laughs> so, uh, the relationship between uh, contemporary art and history, why and how, something to discuss. After learning uh, on a history museum, should you be filled with questions or with answers? Is nostalgic nationalism not also a nostalgia for empire? Is the soft power of progressiveness maybe a new imperialism? Mm -hmm. How is the nation representing itself today? Do minority groups want to be a part of the norm? How do you comment the second verse of Swedish anthem Fon Stora Dar? Mm. Du blev vad du var in terms of nationalism. Mm. In the Sami exhibition, instead of answers, use the questions that Hans mentioned. This is great. May of starting a discussion among the visitors. Could you say how nationalism is reflected in the architecture of the museum? 
great questions. Mm -hmm. So actually, really. this will be the finish for your talk. And thanks a lot. I think uh, applaud. Thanks. Thank